so uh, if you if you have if you like to ask any questions please type it into the chat uh, even even while we uh, discuss in is fine right we will pick up an answer uh, we i mean we would like to do it interactive as possible and keep like keep typing in and asking things um, okay so so we are talking about uh, uh, cloud native engineering uh, let's start by trying to understand what that is right and how it is different from uh, uh, classical software engineering uh, asis do you want to start uh, yeah uh, so i think uh, if you look up uh, the definition of cloud native uh, like uh, so many uh, definitions out there right uh, so like uh, like many things uh, in our industry like you know uh, microservices and so on you know, there are so many terms which are very loosely defined so um, cloud native uh, is again, uh, very vaguely defined and it uh, means uh, different things to uh, different people um, so like i would like to sort of take a very uh, pragmatic approach uh, to the definition uh, so like what i uh, think of uh, when it comes to cloud native software engineering uh and how it is different uh, from traditional software engineering is uh, you develop on the cloud for the cloud right so you are developing uh, your software is going to run on the cloud right so typically if you take traditional software engineering you had uh, these uh, release cycles right so you, uh, you go through your phases and then you create this binary and then like every quarter or like every uh, two months or or every six months you do a release uh, but on cloud native uh, when it comes to cloud native software engineering from day one you are building your features on the cloud so like the, on the platform which is going to run your system right? so you are your developers are building their features on the cloud and those features you know go through different stages and then then get uh, pushed into uh, production so like uh, so when uh, when you have uh, all these build pipelines and uh, processes and uh, best practices all put into practice uh, you know it's very common uh, to ship features and fixes to production even like several times a day uh, so uh, even at uh, you know wso2 uh, that's uh, what uh, we are doing so it's they it requires a mindset change from uh, traditional engineering uh, so um, that's sort of uh, how i look at it so of course you know the technologies the tools and the processes those things are all uh, different but uh, primarily when i what i like to think about is developing on the cloud uh, for the cloud that's really not uh, what do you think about uh, so uh, i think i think uh, so when when i look at the cloud native uh, like engineering especially the definitions i see like two kind of definitions Right, so there are like one set of definitions say that um, if you use these certain kind of technologies, uh, if, if you use certain kind of technologies, that is cloud native engineering. So that is include like the microservices, Kubernetes containers, uh, sometimes um, uh, like specific kind of observability tools, and uh, even some. I mean, sometimes we'll go into uh, think like do it very different to do it very specifically this way right and then this again there's another set of definitions which basically say if you meet these kind of properties like if you are if your setup is loosely coupled if it is um, it can auto scale right if it support or gitops like automation right it, if it like use apis properly etc then it is cloud native uh, now my my view i think i think on this uh, asit and myself like we are pretty close like it's it's a continuum right so i think because the i think point of cloud native engineering is to properly and efficiently build app in the cloud that's the end goal right so then basically when we try to do it based on your requirements you might choose in a continuum where you may land right for example i mean for example uh, the auto scaling is a, is a very valuable property of cloud native but i mean if due to some reason if you have don't need to auto scale you may not do it right but 
but having said that although it is a continuum if you do these things like for example if you use uh, microservices if you use the containers i mean usually most of the time you will use the containers like if you think of observability we will come to this i think th these goals are almost the ideal state right if you do more you do i think better you will play in the cloud but but always you need to think from i mean yes of course you need to be cloud native but also you should ask the question what do i try to achieve what's my goal of my app and do the right thing uh, okay so yeah so uh, so Srinath, uh, so since this is an api days uh, session like uh, uh, i like to like i think want to discuss your thoughts on uh, what the apis mean to uh, cloud native uh, engineer what's the role of apis uh, so, so uh, I think uh, um, I, th I think um, I think okay. We if we looked at the talks etc., we'll see like the I think more and more the APIs are almost almost integral part of the architecture and design, right? Uh, of building new systems, right? And uh, so uh, okay. So I think one very important part of uh, role the API plays in cloud in native engineering is to uh, it brings us ability to reuse things. For for software engineering, for years and years, we are trying to reuse things. We are trying to not to rewrite everything. We are trying to reuse things. We were we were doing libraries. We were doing components. We were doing services, and now we are doing APIs, right? So the I think this is one set, one mindset like this. Like for example, within WSO2, when we try to design, we kind of ask like, okay, can you do that with the API? in a cost effective manner and if its answer is yes we should be doing it with the api right don't try to re-implement the thing so i think i think that's 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 one very important part of the uh, cloud native thinking and uh, aligned to that comes the basically uh, usually api marketplace uh, some manner i mean it could it, like for example, if your environment give you a marketplace, you can use it. That's that's the best practice. But of course, you might share in other ways. So you may go out and find the um, APIs and bring it back. Right. So so this is I think this is one of the one of the very important part. Uh, so to to mention few other things. Uh, the I'll, I'll I'll talk about another two things. One is that. Uh, we, like more and more in new architectures, we are trying to uh, basically build a layer of APIs that can be reused to build the next layer of apps. So, I mean, that's also uh, something that's very useful pattern to think, right? That's how we also try to think. Uh, and, and the third case is that some of your functionalities you will expose at APIs to outside so that others can take it and uh, reuse it and uh, even give you money etc as uh, is any uh, anything else to add? yeah so like what i like uh, like i like your analogy where you said uh, libraries are to traditional engineering where and uh, apis are to cloud native engineering right so uh, more and more uh, so that's a very interesting way of uh, thinking about it you know yeah uh, so, so as I uh, let's let's jump it to the, the uh, like one one. Let's take one step in, right? So, yeah. uh, I, the next question I would like to discuss is that I think this is a, when in the cloud, this is a question everybody asks, right? How much close you go into the cloud vendor? How much uh, like do you try to use all their features, or do you try to put a layer that? Uh, generalize and remove you from the cloud what do you think yeah, yeah so uh, that's a very uh, interesting question like uh, so sometimes you know like um, when people think about their uh, you know cloud architecture from uh, the initial uh, you know uh, the design stage itself they think about you know multi cloud uh, so like uh, what happens is you then start thinking about what abstraction layers you need to bring in to run how to be cloud diagnostic and so on so uh, what uh, what really happens is you end up uh, over engineering your solution and uh, you 
like in most cases what you do is you bring in an addition so like you have to always remember uh, like uh, when it comes to uh, the cloud every bit of complexity that you add you know you ends up you know at a you know you have to pay a certain cost right uh, so let's say you have already like um, like at least for your first version uh, like you have chosen uh, you have chosen to go with a particular cloud uh, vendor right uh, so uh, what i would advise is uh, look at the 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 native services provided by that uh, particular cloud vendor right so if you are use if you are on uh, asia you know and you want to do uh, your, you need to uh, do uh, insights you know asia has its uh, solution for on aws aws has their uh, own uh, solution for that uh, so then like uh, so there are uh, like uh, aspects like that that are that you you are better off actually directly calling into those vendors new uh, native api will yeah. or uh, you know by bringing this additional services so like there are now uh, several projects which are trying to sort of solve this problem and then you know come up with an abstraction layer you program to that layer and then you have the runtime bindings to these different cloud services um so what happens is like uh, one of the limitations in that approach is you are going to end up with a layer which has the least common denominator so even though you are running on a very powerful cloud platform you know which has its native features you might not be able to tap into that so or you might have to do certain things through the abstraction api and for certain things you have to go directly you bypass that layer and you go directly down to the cloud uh, uh, implementation so like uh, like uh, you basically like uh, stick with the cloud vendors so much as possible uh, and then like when you from multi cloud solution and let's say now you have your solution running on aws you need to support it on uh, asia uh you sort of build those integration layers using the cloud vendors uh, services and apis rather than uh you know abstracting it out so um, that's what is the best approach also one other important thing i need to address is like if you bring in an additional bit of complexity you have to think about you know when you're running on the cloud it's like uh, like jeff uh, lawson mentioned it's about uh the trust that people on you right on uh, to run their code or, you know um, so uh, what happens is like when you bring in these additional layers you have to now trust other people's uh, stuff right so you're running on a particular cloud platform you have sls with them that are provided by uh, that uh, cloud uh, provider uh, and then you have uh, support contracts but if you bring in these additional abstraction layers now you have to think about what if those layers fail who is going to support that right uh like is there going to be will uh, the cloud provider uh, help you to troubleshoot issues in that abstraction layer so these are some of the complexities so uh, my personal recommendation would be uh, go with the cloud native uh, services provided by you know, the cloud vendor uh, so that's uh, those are my thoughts uh, shrinath yeah i mean i i do agree and then uh, i mean i personally have worked with in several projects and then let's say hand burn my hands by trying to do this and seen like <laughs> i mean seen a lot of effort and time wasted because sometimes you spend years trying to build this layer that and yeah, like and then and then when you take so much time and when you build the thing thing had moved right so uh, so but but uh, let, let me actually ask this very interesting question which is that if now if you build a product that's used by many cust many different customers and if subset of customers want it in azure and other half want it in aws what do we do i think that's that's an interesting question yeah <laughs> so so like uh, what i would uh, suggest is you know uh, like uh, look at it in a native way right so i would like to think of it as uh, you know, you have uh, your customers who are running uh, let's say you, you are providing a mobile app right so you Uh, build. Uh, you have you have to build for the Android platform. You have to build for the iOS platform. So you have to build the uh, the native app so that you know you give the best possible experience on that particular platform, 
right so uh, if you want to sort of leverage the entire the, the, the strength uh, of that particular platform you know you, the best way to do it is you know you have to uh, uh, you have to uh, build for that particular platform so unfortunately you know there's no standardization so let's say uh, if there was some sort of uh, standardization and you could uh, rely on these standards uh, and then like the cloud uh, providers apis you know adhere to those standards you might have simply you know adhere to those things and it, you might be able to interoperate on uh, different cloud platforms but uh, that is not the reality uh, so like uh, personally what uh, i would do is you know i would think about when i the solution from what like you have to think of think about a solution in terms of building blocks right so you are now going to build on asia what are the building blocks asia is providing and how do i build my solution there and again like what are the uh, building blocks aws provide right? so like conceptually some things might be similar but uh, i would like uh, look at it that way because um, that would make the solution much more robust in my opinion yes. Yes. Uh, so next i think let's let's go into a, i think maybe the most in interesting challenge or interesting uh, decisions you would make as a uh, as a building cloud native applications, which is that what are the typical choices you would make uh, while building app in the cloud, right? I think one of them we already uh, already discussed, right? One is like, okay, do you, you have to decide whether do you want to portable across the cloud or do you go to the interface, right? And, and sometimes actually we can go to the interface and still be portable by like building half into the interface, then keeping another layer away, right? Uh, uh, Asis, do you have any thought on other yeah. choices that we can? Yes. Yeah, so, like, uh, especially when you are building uh, on the cloud, like, uh, there are uh, considerations. Like, as a developer, uh, what I would uh, recommend, or uh, what I would recommend every developer who is building for the cloud to think about is, okay, you have to think about how am I going to secure my feature. So, let's say you are developing features for the cloud. Right, so security has to be a very important concern, not an afterthought. And then the other thing is observability, right? So how do I know that my feature is running properly on the cloud, right? So this is again like uh, like uh, similar to uh, the test uh, first approach, right? So when you are developing a feature, you sort of think how first you think how can I test this feature? So like rather than jumping into implementing it, you think about how can I, how am I going to test this? So similarly on the cloud, you have to think about how I'm going to observe this, how am I going to make this uh, secure, right? So you have to, two things are very important in my opinion, you know. Yes, yes. And uh, I mean, both of us today morning come from debugging uh, <laughs> issue in the morning. So I mean, we can, you know, the value just hours yes. ago, right? And uh, like, uh, the, because because i mean some issues of course some issues are trivial and easy to find the root cause some uh, happen re happen really and it's very hard to go and figure out what's going on right so yeah. uh, so so i I'll, I'll i'll add a little bit into that uh, i think one other choice is that at least to some extent how would you implement the services like for example you could you could do in something like a go something like ballerina that we have something like that and put into a container and basically put it into the cloud right or you you might go and choose to do it in a pass i like pass or even like the courier pass uh, we are putting out etc or, or you might go to serverless right or you might do a combination right so uh, again the now uh, now, actually, uh, one in, important question is like, okay, can I do microservices and serverless? Now, it's all it's it's a little bit of a trick question because it depends on how you define things. But I I would say yes, right? I mean, but I think the applicable use cases it depends on the use case because some use cases the serverless has like high latencies etc might be a problem, but. But for some use case, of course, you can think the microservice architecture, and then you can put it in the serverless, and then put the rest into the cloud services, and just it is there. Like you don't see a deployment; it's in the yeah. in the cloud uh, directly, right? And of course, of course, you had to worry about how you handle the data, right? Including the databases, NoSQL. Do you need NoSQL? It's just databases, 
consistency replication how you recover data uh, caching all these things right so i mean to uh, of course of course the most of the typical concerns we'll do uh, when we do the distributed system replicate app applies here but because of the cloud then it bring in these other uh, other situation other considerations yeah. so uh, there's a so, the audience uh, uh, so uh, i guess uh, serverless is the future uh, okay uh, you want to take that up srinath or uh, okay i'll i'll give it a try right uh, yeah. okay so <laughs> now uh, okay if you consider current pricing <laughs> maybe not but it could change right uh, it could change uh, so it so okay let at least in my view there are a certain set of use cases where serverless is serverless is very useful and very powerful but if you are building a very complicated system i think what's out there isn't enough and it uh, basic and uh, like okay well, one problem we already discussed to some extent uh, the uh, uh, so which is that so i mean uh, one problem is that the, the time it can run is limited right so uh, you basically it time out and it dies right so you have to figure out everything in the short case right and it is not it is not up always right and the first request have a very high latency of course you can keep it up then basically you pay the full cost of keeping it uh, keeping it all the time right uh, so uh, now uh, so if if your use case is small like and if you are trying to like trans like try if you are if you have two things and you want to glue it somehow and uh, somehow the whatever the integration thing you have is not enough so this of course is like it's easy and obvious thing to start with right but i think if you are trying to build let's say 50 to 100 service complicated thing um it's not as obvious yeah i i think i think then you need the control and so it it may be but i'm not if you, if you ask me i'm not convinced it is the 100% future it will be a 20 to 30% future for sure as is any so I, yeah, yeah i also feel that i agree to say that uh, so like uh, so you have to solve as has its place and you know as well you know like like microservice has microservices place uh, and other technologies have their place like rdms you know it's uh, you know when uh, no sql came people said okay rdms is uh, obsolete right but rdms has its place like rdms uh, is an established technology you know no sql has its place so similarly serverless uh, is uh, the new sort of the relatively new kid on the block but it has its place so like for certain use cases yes uh, serverless is the way to go but uh, Uh, i wouldn't sort of insist uh, on a you know building your entire solution like srinath said based on serverless so of course if you have something that is applicable yeah you uh, have to run something based on a trigger uh, you know a few times a day you don't uh, require very high uh, throughput and things like that you no know, yeah serverless might be uh, a good uh, fit for that so uh, so definitely you know in uh, like modern cloud native architectures uh, serverless has its place uh, but we have to again look at uh, the use case uh, and look at the other requirements and constraints and then uh, use it like uh, what i heard is you know uh, sometimes like uh, when you have too many uh, functions as a service uh, running uh, what happens is it becomes a big governance problem because you know these are all asynchronously working like it's running somewhere based on triggers Uh, so you don't know who triggered which and based on that you know one serverless function triggers something else uh, so it could get uh, very tricky to observe and uh, troubleshoot right so like, uh, like uh, we know that when you build uh, complex uh, cloud native solutions how important uh, tracing and observability is so uh, so uh, so those are some aspects that you have to think about when you are using uh, serverless Uh, so so i i think i think one other very important point of serverless is it's not set in stone right some of these things might change like uh, the cloud providers can improve it so things might change so we we actually we are almost out of time uh, so let's 
Aziz, any last part in thoughts? Uh, yeah. So, uh, like, uh, like, why I always like to, you know, uh, sort of uh, think of uh, uh, cloud native uh, software engineering as, you know, giving more power to the developer and developers have to think about developing on the cloud, right? From day one, think about that. So if you are new to cloud native software engineering and you want to get into this, uh, don't uh, you know um, just build stuff on your machine, test it, create you know containers, and then ship it off for somebody else to run it on the cloud. You yourself, as a developer, should experience how your code is running on the cloud. So that's my parting message. Yes, we not. Okay. Yes. So, so uh, the one, actually one question I nowadays when I try to design something I kind of trying to ask is uh, when can I rewrite it? Because uh, because I mean at least one thing I had learned is that if you take let's say if you take years and build a system you think will last ten years, uh, unfortunately they don't last ten years. But the, uh, basically, if you try to oh, like overreach on the features etc instead of the building for what you need right now and what you need for the immediate future you usually end up like wasting a lot of time and become late to the market etc so i i kind of try to ask the question when can i re rewrite it like and sometimes it says like if i get 10 times um, customers more okay i'll have a party and we'll rewrite it right so i think <laughs> so uh, at least uh, so i think i think that's I think that's a, that's a very important way to look at the architecture, especially in this world where things are in flux. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Asis. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Srinath. That was a very wonderful <laughs> discussion. Goodbye. Goodbye.